Please, won't you play with me? Pray with me. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) I told the choir that I was punchy today, and that is a good example of what I mean. (laughs) Okay. Please, won't you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. There's a saying in self-help and, I don't know, Instagram culture that uh, I used to love. I mean, I think I had stickers, you know, that said it, that I would put on my laptop, and I've come to greatly dislike it upon further reflection. It is the term, you are enough. Have you seen this before? I know where the sentiment comes from. Um, It is meant to empower those of us who have been hurt in the past by people or situations that suggest that we are not enough, right? That we are unworthy of respect or love. And so I appreciate the sentiment. It is supposed to mean something like you don't need to do anything or be anyone else. And that is something that I think is true. But uh, you are enough, I don't think that's true. Not at all. I don't know about you, but I am absolutely not enough. (laughs) If I'm all there is, we are all in big trouble. (laughs) Because I cannot change myself or the world on my own. I need the bumpers. I need all of you. And I need transcendent love to hold it all together. That's why I do what I do. So I believe very strongly that there is enough, but I am not enough, not on my own. So that's why I'm glad you keep showing up here when it is easier to stay in bed and watch us on YouTube. And although I am glad that our people on YouTube are watching too. Hi, friends. (laughs) And I'm glad that more of you want to join this love revolution that's sweeping central Massachusetts because we're not enough on our own. We had a fantastic path to membership class last week. We have just amazing new members who are about to join us. We are so lucky. If you are still interested in joining, you didn't come that day, please see me because December 10th is our um, new member Sunday, and we would love to welcome you to membership on that day. But anyway, in this class, we talked about the history of this church, and we talked about our connection to our Puritan ancestors and how they'd be rolling over in their graves if they knew what we had done with their church. And we talked about our Baptist and our congregational ancestors, and we talked about our progressive Unitarian ancestors in the 19th century, who in the 20th century decided that one didn't even need to believe in God in order to be part of a church community. And while we certainly aren't a traditional Unitarian church, I told them that we are a Christian church who unabashedly and without reservation welcomes atheists and agnostics with no agenda to try and change their beliefs. And we really mean that. And for some in our group, that was an interesting concept. Why would you practice Christianity if you didn't believe in God, someone asked. That's a reasonable question, isn't it? I thought so, too. So I said so. I said, good question. And I also said, some of the best Christians I know don't believe in God, which they thought was kind of a crazy answer. But it is true. Because being a Christian is not just about what you believe. I don't even think that's the most important part. Being Christian is a way of life. It means binding yourself to a particular community and practicing the way of Jesus. You can certainly practice the sacrificial love and servanthood of Jesus, I think, without believing every single day, without ceasing, in a supernatural God. So it's good to ask, why does God allow so much suffering in the world? And it's transformative to ask, why do I? I don't know if that was an acceptable answer to my past membership class. 
But when I read the prophet Amos this week in 2023, I don't know, did you read along? It was kind of harsh that it was basically saying that what we're doing right now is trash. (laughs) I can't help but think of all of the people in the United States who have stopped going to church. Maybe they stop going for good reason, usually, because they stop believing, maybe, or the, and the church they were part of couldn't manage that part of their spiritual journey, which is absolutely a part of almost everyone's spiritual journey at one point or another. Maybe they stopped because they rightly found the church a place of judgment and hypocrisy, and we all know that some churches are a place of judgment, hypocrisy, or even just boring and irrelevant right? Which some churches are, certainly not our church. Maybe they stop going to church because they have no interest in arguing over what color to paint the parlor or whether they like traditional or contemporary hymns. Maybe they stop going to church simply because their church wasn't practicing what it preaches. Did any of you leave churches because of that? Because they weren't? Oh, yes, okay. So a lot of you. There is a proliferation of people right now who call themselves spiritual but not religious. We did a lot of hand-wringing over this while we were in seminary. And you find this out rather quickly as a pastor because whenever I tell someone what I do for a living, some people just start to apologize immediately (laughs) as if, I don't know, they'd go to my church if they... (laughs) if they had a church to go to, but they say things like, I haven't been to church in a long time. I'm so sorry. (laughs) I see myself, they say, as more spiritual but not religious. It is usually the next rather proud confession that they make. The truth is, though, my friends, calling oneself spiritual but not religious isn't a unique position at all. In the 2023 Gallup poll, fully 33% of the respondents called themselves spiritual but not religious. That's one-third of the country who identifies as SBNR, spiritual but not religious. According to Philip D. Kennison, many of those studied who identify as spiritual but not religious feel a tension between their personal spirituality and membership in a conventional religious organization. We hate institutions. Americans are big on that right now, right? So like the members of this church, like the members of this church, most of them value curiosity and intellectual freedom and an experimental approach to religion. I would say we do too. And many go so far as to view organized religion as the major enemy of authentic spirituality, claiming that spirituality is a private enterprise, a reflection and private experience, not public ritual. And to be religious connotes something else. It conveys an institutional uh, connection. It's usually associated with the Abrahamic traditions. So to attend worship services and to say mass and to light Hanukkah candles, that's religious, right? To be spiritual, in contrast, connotes personal practice and personal empowerment having to do with the deepest motivations in life. As a result, in cultures that are deeply suspicious of institutional structures like this one, who place a high value on individual freedom and autonomy, spirituality has come to have largely positive connotations while religion has been viewed more negatively. According to Robert Fuller, the spiritual but not religious phenomenon can be characterized as a mix of intellectual progressivism and mystical hunger, impatient with the piety of established churches, a lot like Amos. Away with your festivals and your stupid songs or whatever he says, to paraphrase the prophet. I have nothing but love for my spiritual but not religious fellow Americans. Like I said, so many of my friends are SBNR. But I like to call myself proudly religious but not spiritual. What R-B-N-S, religious but not spiritual. The word religion comes from the Latin religiare, which means to bind together. 
And I cannot imagine a life in which I am not bound together in a group of religious people trying to figure out how to love them when it is occasionally hard to even like them. And when it's occasionally hard to even like me, they love me back. And I don't go to church because God expects me to worship the right way, but because God calls me to be a part of a human community of people trying their level best to bring about the reign of love on earth. For the most part, I do not encounter God through any sort of individual endeavor. While I too can find God's handiwork in a sunset on a beach or at the top of the mountain, I cannot imagine finding God outside the circle of humanity. Escaping humanity for individual freedom and autonomy sounds to me like a uniquely American attempt to escape God herself. Lillian Daniel says, being privately spiritual but not religious just doesn't interest me. There is nothing challenging about having deep thoughts all by oneself. What is interesting is doing this work in community where other people might call you on stuff or, heaven forbid, disagree with you. Where life with God gets rich and provocative is when you dig deeply into a tradition that you did not invent all for yourself. Sometimes digging into our tradition is hard <laughs> and we can do hard things. So today, in our reading from Amos, he talks about the day of the Lord. And this is incorporated into our prophetic and apocalyptic texts of the Bible and uses military images to uh, describe God as a divine warrior who will conquer our enemies. In the Hebrew Bible, the enemies of the Lord are Israel's enemies. And in these visions, the day of the Lord brings victory for the people of ancient Israel. Other prophets use the imagery as a warning to Israel and its leaders because the day of the Lord will mean destruction for the biblical nations of Israel and Judah. The day is supposed to mean divine apocalyptic judgment at the end of the world. This is not the God we talk about very often, but it is the God of Amos. And there are many evangelical Christians who welcome the current Israeli-Hamas war because of scriptures like the one we read today in the book of Amos. So I found it chilling to read it this week in particular. They believe that a holy war will hasten the day of the Lord as prophesied by Isaiah and Amos when Jesus will come back to judge the living and the dead and rapture the believers up to heaven. Does this sound familiar to you? Yes. First of all, the preachers who tell you that the Bible predicted all of this horror in Israel and Gaza are lying to you. That's not how the Bible works. It is not a horoscope. It is not a forecaster or a fortune teller. Christ is already there in the Holy Land. God sits close to the suffering. Christ is under the rubble with the babies of Gaza. Christ is imprisoned in the underground tunnels with the kidnapped Israelis. Christ weeps at the injustice of babies dying on behalf of adult sinfulness. Yes? And it kind of depends on which prophet you're reading and what kind of mood he's in if the day of the Lord will be a good thing resulting in triumph or a terrifying thing resulting in judgment. For the prophet Amos, who we read today, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment for the ways in which the people have failed to live up to God's desire for a world made whole. So this is not the warm and fuzzy God that we read about so often in the New Testament, but this is the God who believes that justice is what love looks like in public, right? 
Amos knows that the concepts of justice and righteousness go together. Justice refers to fairness, attention to the needs of the poor, an end to oppression, and a legal system that protects the rights of all people. And righteousness connotes healthy relationships, a sense of commonality, a recognition of God as the father of all people, yes, therefore connector of us all. Amos calls for immediate justice in this text, a sudden deluge of justice rolling down like waters, an urgent, steady supply of justice for all people. And he says, alas for you, those who await this day, it is darkness, not light. Amos's vision of God is rather terrifying. God is a lion, a bear, a biting snake. He's the God who is furious that in the face of injustice, our human response is to tweet out our thoughts and prayers from the comfort of our home office. The day of the Lord for Amos is the day that God chastens the proud and the lofty. God will raise up the poor and the oppressed and put down everyone else who has been lifted up in this culture. God will raise up the hated and put down the celebrity. God will raise up the poor and put down the rich. God will find the immigrants and refugees a home and leave those who own McMansions homeless. The day of the Lord is the day that the losers win and the winners go down to the dust. That's Amos's God. And in the Hebrew Bible, there are all kinds of instances where God commands our worship and our offerings. But Amos says that God hates our singing. I love your singing, by the way. But Amos says that God hates it and that our lame $10 offerings in the offering plate or our show-offy attempts at looking like we are doing something to change the world by just going to a building to sing hymns and drink coffee together afterward. Don't just go to church, he says. Be the church, yes? Amos God looks at his watch while we serve communion and demands that we hurry up and feed the hungry next. Amos' God watches us sing, here I am, Lord, send me, and then wonders why we aren't going anywhere but back to our homes to leaf blow our backyards. Amos doesn't care if we believe. Amos doesn't care that we worship. Amos cares that we act. Yes? Amen. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Okay, harsh. I happen to like the noise of our songs. But point taken, Amos. Faith without works is dead. And beloved, this cultural moment calls for bravery. It calls for songs. It calls for prayers. It calls for gathering in worship. It calls for offerings. And it calls for justice and righteousness in our relationships with each other and the world. Whether we are believers or not, we need to be brave enough to admit that we cannot go it alone. We need the bumpers, like Kate said. It is only together that we can fulfill the promise of God, and we must teach our children this. As the psalmist says, we must pass down to them the dark sayings of old. The Bible begins in a garden, but it ends in a city. The divine mystery is revealed in the hospital room, in the soup kitchen, in the crush of bodies on the subway train, in the hairdresser's chair, in the loud bar room with the sticky floors, the choir, the crack house, and yes, even the church. God is present in human bodies, tabernacles made good and holy enough to be resurrected from the dead. The children must know the countercultural truth that they are not enough, but there is always enough because we have each other and we have God, who some of us just call love. The day of the Lord is coming, beloved. 
And may God find us bound together on the way of Christ. May our songs of love and our meager offerings lead to enacting justice and peace like an ever-flowing stream. Amen.